Anyway, president of the society, uh, we have a few board members here tonight. I want to rem remind everyone that we're coming up for re-election or election in December, and uh, so I would really appreciate it if we had a few more people apply to be mem members of the board. We, some of us, have been on here for 11 to 12 years, and we're getting old. Okay, so we have a couple of things tonight I'll talk about here. Um, we have a thing, uh, uh, the newsletter. Now, I've been sending out newsletter by email. We had it sent out in hard copy before. Does everybody like the new newsletter that's getting it? Yeah? You like that stuff in there? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know where the latest picture is? Of the, you know, the little contest I put in there? Has anybody figured that out? The cars in the intersection? Yeah, we got somebody in the back. No, I really missed the Canadian coffee with. Oh, okay, yeah. I know it. we have a few that do, and I don't know. It's, we'll talk about that again. So anyhow, last month was pretty good. I many knew that already, that there was a public restroom in downtown Bellingham. Now it's a beauty shop. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right. So I want to thank the people that brought in the goodies tonight. and. Uh, so we got your choice selection of cookies and some punch there. Pretty good stuff. We have some future presentations coming up. Next month, we'll be doing our little program for December. And included in that is a description of the Christmas ship by Don Wright, not, or White. Uh, it, no, it's Wright. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right. Um, and he, he ran the ship for a number of years, and uh, there's quite a history behind that. And so we're going to see a presentation there. The uh, January one will be me again, and I'll be talking about White City. That was uh, a carnival up at uh, Silver Beach, and uh, there's lots of pictures and information about that. Um, we have a program in February about uh, historical places in Whatcom County. And in uh, March, uh, um, Troy Luganville is going to give a presentation. I'm not sure what on yet. Yeah. So anyhow, I'm going to pass that on to our next uh, person here. Fred's going to come up and talk about. Got April. Oh, April. Yes. OK. So we're going to hear about a, a new book in April from, uh, uh, sure, <laughs> from Candace Wellman. And uh, she's going to talk about one of our early people here. Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. The guy was really something else. He ran the coal mine here in the early uh, 50s. So. Without further ado, I'm going to have Fred come up and talk about our speakers and our speaker tonight. Well, welcome one and all. Um, I just met our presenter. I just met our presenter. And, um, She's already excited me by her spirit and the things that she knows about this, the things she knows about the area. So she's uh, from Whidbey Island and going to talk a little bit about the history of that. If you read the blurb in our newsletter, um, she's going to talk about Colonel Granville. Uh, his peripatetic adventures with the U.S. Army provide a chronicle of Washington's territorial history. And for some of you who don't remember, um, Island County, Skagit County were part of Whatcom County originally. And um, so I'm not going to give you any more details because that's her, her uh, pur 
overview and uh, I would like to now present for you Lynn Hyde, who is the Executive Director of Historic Whidbey, located in Coopville, Washington. So, welcome. How's that? Is that good? Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, in Coopville at 7.30, everybody's going to bed, so I'm really impressed with your fortitude. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I, um, I am the director of Historic Whidbey, which is a nonprofit in Coopville that is kind of a two-headed beast. Uh, one is, is we are a, a historic preservation organization uh, dedicated to trying to preserve historic resources on Whidbey Island. Um, but we're also interested in um, public history. Uh, it's great to save old buildings, but if you can't share the stories that come with the buildings, it's hard to get people to care about them. So uh, we start, our organization started, scary, going on 10 years ago now, uh, when the Colonel Granville Haller House in Coopville uh, was put on the market, a house that had been um, built Part of it was built in 1859, part of it was built in 1866, and it had been badly neglected for at least 100 years when we started trying to save it. Uh, it had been saved by, from complete neglect by a family that lived in it for 50 years, from 1952 to 2002, but they had allowed a great jungle to grow up around it so that nobody knew the house was there, uh, and it, it saved it from vandalism and probably kept it wet enough that it couldn't catch on fire. <laughs> so, so when we inherited it, it did not have, um, the full suite of plumbing was uh, a toilet under the stairs that you had to bend over like Groucho Marx to use, and, uh, and a kitchen sink. There was no bath or tub or anything like that. All the wiring was exposed dangling from the ceilings on, on hooks. Uh, and all the heat apparently must have come from um, the wood fireplaces that were in it. So, um, so we still don't have, the good news is we don't have to put, we don't have to revamp uh, any of the systems because we get to start as if it were a brand new house again. Um, but anyway, um, part of the joy of saving this place is that, um, is that it just happened that the uh, officer that lived in this house was the Forrest Gump of Pacific Northwest history. Uh, anywhere there was a scandal, a war, um, Indian troubles, uh, uh, British boundary troubles, Granville Haller was sure to be in there uh, trying to make it right. Maybe he was making it wrong, I don't know, but he also got to all kinds of wonderful trouble during the Civil War. Uh, so he's a really fascinating character. His family is fascinating. And so I'm going to do uh, kind of a quick uh, sprint through his resume uh, with a little bit of talk about his house as well. So um, I'm glad to know that we're, I haven't moved so far out of uh, my territory that we are not on Coast Salish lands anymore. So when I do the land acknowledgement, um, uh, I am still in the same place. I just realized that the laptop is not right in front of me, so I'm going to have to turn around to read it. <laughs> I'm used to having it right in front of me. Um, we are gathering on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people. Since time immemorial, the Coast Salish have called Whidbey Island home, stewarding this bountiful land for millennia. We honor Coast Salish elders, their descendants, and future generations who continue their lifeways on and around Whidbey Island. So I'm sure that um, most of you know that we're living in times where the way that we talk about history is changing. We have to be um, much more sensitive about how we present history. We need to include more diverse voices. Um, and it makes it, um, it makes it challenging for an old history dog like me to reorient everything. But I do want to start out by saying that uh, my background is all in Euro-American history studies, uh, historiography, so it's inevitable that um, I will have bias no matter how objective I try to be. If there's things that I leave out, I, I apologize in advance. 
One of the problems we have is I think we all in the history business want to be more inclusive and to tell undertold stories of diverse peoples, but we're not really the ones to do it. So we're in a, I think we're in a period where we need to engage um, uh, uh, diverse populations to tell their own stories. So uh, just um, f for your information, uh, there is a great podcast that is uh, now going on um, that you can visit online. Fort Stillicum, not Fort Stillicum, Fort Nisqually Living History Museum uh, last year hosted a series of four panels with local tribal members. Uh, and they, um, they got to share their stories. This is South Sound tribes like the Nisqually, the Puyallup. Um, the stories of what the treaty era meant to their people at the time that the treaties were being signed and as it affects them still today. It was such a successful um, series of panels that they turned it into a podcast. And I'm hoping that someday up here in the North Sound, uh, which is a completely different set of tribes, of course, that we can have that same opportunity for tribes to speak for themselves about uh, the conversion of our uh, European culture and their native culture here. Wrong button, sorry. Okay, the howlers in their house. So this uh, is a this uh, I include this uh, picture of the house from a couple of years ago when we had it up on stilts so that we could give it a new concrete foundation. Um, the windows are all out being rehabbed. It's not very photogenic as you can see. We've cleared most of the jungle in front of it, um, but you know historic preservation is an act of love. It's something you need a lot of imagination for. Uh, you can't just look at a house like that and go, oh, I'll bet that was beautiful, or oh, that is gonna be so beautiful in the future. Uh, I'm sure most of the people who walk by go, what in the world have they got themselves into? Well, this is the way I see it when I look at it. <laughs> There's no bluebirds in the painting, but I put them in there. So just a quick note on Central Whidbey. Um, Central, uh, Coopville, um, if, how many here have actually been to Coopville? Oh, most of you. So you know, it's got all that historic charm, right? The, the Haller House is actually right in there. Chances are really, really good that unless you were, have been there in the last couple of years, you had no idea the Haller House was right in the middle of downtown. Um, uh, but it is. So uh, you may know that uh, that area is also a unit of the National Park Service, a partnership unit called Evie's Landing National Historical Reserve. Um, that reserve is overlaid on the pre-existing Central Woodby Island Historic District. And the reason it's so significant is because it is home to the best, the densest um, collection of pre-1870 houses in the state. So really the first 20 years of Americans, uh, Euro-American settlement here, uh, their houses are still standing. You know, uh, when, when the settlers first came out here, they were used to going everywhere on a boat. So no matter where you were, you had a good chance of building a big town there uh, as long as you had access to the water. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't stay that way. And so when all transportation started moving to ground transportation instead of, um, uh, ships, then uh, Whidbey sort of uh, became a backwater and was frozen in time. But in the early 1850s, it was a contender, like all the buildings that, um, or all the little towns that had sprung up by 1855, who all thought they were going to be the next New York of the West, whether it was Port Townsend or Seattle or Olympia or here. Uh, believe it or not, Whidbey Island actually had high aspirations. So just a quick romp through some of the um, oldest houses uh, in the reserve. Uh, the 1852 Fairhaven, the 1854 Coop House, the 1855 Island County Courthouse. This is the oldest uh, courthouse that survives in the state. Uh, the Jacob Eby House, if you've heard of Isaac Eby, um, uh, this was uh, his parents' house. Uh, and of course, Evie's Landing is named after uh, primarily Isaac and his, uh, his prairie, but his parents were there too. This is owned by the National Park Service and is open in the summer on weekends. 
Um, this wonderful house, 1858 Engel House, uh, you can tell it's an old picture. This is why we, need a, we decided we needed a preservation organization in the community because this is what it looks like today. There's a lot of problems when you have um, houses in private ownership and the owners are not able to um, maintain it. And once it get, gets past a certain point, they don't have the money to bring it back. This house in particular is a real challenge for us because the people who live in it are the seventh generation of this family to live in this house, and yet they are not able to maintain it. So Historic Whidbey is, is uh, trying to help them out um, with putting together a preservation plan to bring the, the farmhouse and the buildings that come with it, the farm buildings, um, to save them, bring them back. The Ferry House, this is a famous one out by the landing. If you've ever gone out to hike or gone to the 80s Landing State Park, this is the, the very um, evocative, apparently abandoned building uh, out on, on the way to the beach. It is uh, owned by the National Park Service, but at the, at the moment it is not in a condition that allows people to go inside. Um, another 1860 uh, farmhouse within the reserve, another farmhouse in the reserve, uh, this is downtown. Seaside Spa and Salon is one. Um, it is the, is it the oldest? It is, if not the oldest, then the second oldest house on Front Street in Coopville. And Toby's, of course, is famous. This was built in 1866 um, uh, for one of the first uh, merchants. The history of this one. This one was, um, it was, uh, well, it's the oldest commercial store still standing in Coopville. And they have good muscles too. Oh, I should go back. So this is the oldest picture that we have. Maybe I should just turn this. I was just going to say, if you turn this, turn it this way. Maybe then you can do both at one time. Yes. That'd be helpful. Yes. I have to be able to see you so I know when I'm putting you to sleep. That's <laughs> so this is the oldest picture that we have of uh, the Haller House, and that is Granville Haller coming down the stairs. So you can see that at one time it was a pretty handsome dwelling. Um, you might also have been able to see from the other houses that I showed you that this was pretty palatial compared to what everybody else was building. Um, he was a, a career army man, and. Uh, he liked to present himself with authority, and his house did the same thing on Front Street. Uh, a few years after they moved in, they added this conservatory bay, uh, which his wife was a very um, avid horticulturalist. She came from Ireland, she loved plants, she collected them, and uh, uh, they built, he built this for her uh, soon after they moved in. Uh, we, are, we have just recently rebuilt this. This was a part of the house that had been lost in the 1940s, and we have rebuilt it. So it was a big part of Coopville's early downtown. This is the wharf in about 1880, or the waterfront in about 1884. Uh, some of the houses, the storefronts, the, the store buildings that you see there are still there, but not very many. Um, the Haller House is all the way down at the end. Um, and it had in its front corner of the property there the very first commercial uh, building. It was built in 1859 by Raphael Brunn, uh, and at the time that he did that, uh, there, Coopville was not really a town yet because it was still uh, an Indian village. Uh, so his wharf and his warehouse all came pretty quickly after the treaties were signed. The treaties were signed in 1859, and that's when the native peoples who lived along Penn Cove began to move off to reservations. And when they did that, it opened up um, prime uh, wharf territory for the white settlers. And so Coopville doesn't really start to develop until the native peoples have started to go to the reservations. But this is, it was at that time, at the transition time, that the, um, the Haller property started to be developed, the first wharf in Coopville. Uh, just another view of it a few years later, uh, 1890, when the Mosquito Fleet was uh, visiting Coopville regularly. Uh, the, <laughs> this, believe it or not, uh, the white building that you see with the flags hanging from it, that is uh, uh, the Haller House is to the left of it, 
and that building was the only movie theater there ever was in Coopville, um, which lasted for about 20 years. And this is the backyard. All this uh, behind the Haller House is on the very left, and uh, all that yard is now uh, destined to be developed as public green space. So we're really happy to see this be a place that the public can come and visit the house and visit the gardens. Um, I think it'll really add a lot to the experience of Coopville. So what makes their house special is not just that it's a survivor, that it's architecturally interesting, because could, we could do a whole talk just on the architectural history of the Northwest and why this house is um, kind of a Frankenstein building with lots of different building styles in it. But um, the real joy of it for me is the stories of the people who built it. Um, the Hallers, Henrietta and uh, Haller, they were married in 1849 in York, York, Pennsylvania, right after he came back from the Mexican War. You can see he did very well. Uh, he, was, he came out breveted as a, uh, he was a captain breveted as a major when um, he came out of the Mexican War. So he's going to find himself after the war, like many of the famous Civil War generals who fought for both sides, are going to spend some time cutting their teeth as lower level officers in the Pacific Northwest before the Civil War. So. I, kind of, I love to give a, an idea of what uh, kind of landscape they were coming into, and I think that this is all, this is the Salish Sea, this is the homeland of the Coast Salish people. It's easier for us to understand why this part of the world, part of the geography was so important if you lose your orientation where north is on top. Because as soon as you turn the map, and the star is where Penn Cove is on the central Whidbey Island, you can see by the geography, by the way um, the Straits of Juan de Fuca, uh, Puget Sound, and the Georgia Straits all come together at this intersection. And uh, it's like I-5 meets I-90 um, for native canoe um, people. So their, their culture is very, they, they're very much intermarried. Their culture is very consistent. And so you can just see how nature has kind of created this cocoon. Um, for the Coast Salish here in the Salish Sea. Um, it means there's going to be a lot of trade in the area, and the trade is not, the trade is not just going to come from salt water. The trade is also going to come um, from, over the, uh, from the east side, the Plateau tribes coming over the Cascades, because three of the Cascade um, passes, the rivers that come, are uh, entering on the east side of Whidbey Island. Whidbey Island's pretty long, so you've got the Skagit River, the Stillaguamish and the Snohomish all entering into salt water on the east side of Whidbey Island. So if you are trading with any tribe on the Salish Sea up into British Columbia and all the way up to southeast Alaska, if you're trading over the mountains with the Yakima um, or the Cayuse or anyone on that side, um, you're probably at some point going to have to come through uh, Central Whidbey. Uh, and so Penn Cove, on Penn Cove, uh, George Vancouver and Charles Wilkes, the British and American explorers that first came here, noted that Penn Cove was the most densely um, populated native settlement that they saw anywhere in the Salish Sea. And Charles Wilkes said they were the most advanced in civilization. So that's the lower Skagit that are living on Penn Cove. And here are the rivers. So it's a pretty strategic place for something that now is a vacation backwater. <laughs> so um, really quickly, uh, it, 1850 is when things are really going to explode here. This is when the first settlers have, the Willamette Valley has uh, filled up with Oregon Trail farmers. And so the only place um, for you to, to get some good farmland is to jump the Columbia and start coming up here. And so. The years of 1850 to 1855 are when the government uh, created the Oregon Donation Land Law, and this is when the government says, if you can work, a, if you can work a piece of land, a claim for four years, uh, and develop it, you can keep up to 320 acres. If you bring your wife 
640 acres. It's all yours, it's free. And so it created an incredible land rush into the Puget Sound area. So the Salish communities here, who are used to trading with Eastern Plateau tribes, they're used to trading with um, other coastal natives from British Columbia and Alaska. Uh, and now, um, and of course, as you know, by this time, there's also been for 20 years or so, um, Hudson Bay Company forts. And the, the thing that really set the Hudson Bay Company apart, from, the British apart from the Americans, Americans here, is that the Americans were not here, but I shouldn't say that, the British were not here to create settlements. They're not bringing their women and children and their oxen and their tools. They're coming to trade. It's a commercial operation. It's not, it's not nation building. And so for, those, for the years that they are here before the Americans arrive, there's a pretty stable, relatively peaceful relationship between the Hudson's Bay Company and the um, Coast Salish because everybody's benefiting from the trade. Both sides are benefiting from the trade. But when the Americans come, that's, gonna, um, that's going to really throw a monkey wrench into things. Uh, not to give the British too much credit on that. Inadvertently, it was not something they intended to do, but the increase in trade that the Hudson Bay Company brought really changed the dynamics of native economies. And so it ended up, um, it ended up triggering um, a rating system, especially from tribes north of here, from um, Southeast Alaska and British Columbia. They're coming down to trade with the Hudson's Bay Company, but they're also here to raid native villages um, and take slaves. Often taking slaves was one of the worst things. So native cultures out here, slavery was pretty common throughout the Northwest, but it became very, very um, um, aggressive and virulent once the, the, um, once the Europeans brought their trade in and the incentive to get wealthy um, drove, the, drove them to more aggressive actions. So when the Americans come in, they're gonna create their own problems because they're here to dispossess, they're not here to trade. And, um, and so native peoples though, they're gonna have, they have more than one threat. People on the west side of the Cascades have the Americans to deal with who are trying to dispossess them, but they also have to deal with the fact that these raiders are coming down from up north who are murdering and enslaving their people, and it's having a devastating effect on their community. So it's a big clash that comes here in the 1850s as what are really three separate native cultures the Plateau tribes, the Coast Salish, and the Northern um, Indians, and then two Europeans, and they're all converging here on Puget Sound. So to me, the 1850s is the most dynamic and fascinating period in Northwest history. There's the last one. Okay, so where's Granville Haller and all this? Granville Haller comes out here with the army in 1854. They're ostensibly here to protect settlers on the Oregon Trail. Um, but as they would tell you, they were also not just here to protect uh, settlers from native people, but to protect native people from settlers. Uh, you know, a lot of the people that came out here, uh, some of them were, were um, families just trying to find a better life, but for a lot of them, they were people that were not big on the rules, they were not big on restrictions, they were not big on government, and so they came out here to get away where they wouldn't have to listen to any rules. So even though treaties were signed in the mid-1850s, it doesn't mean that prospectors and settlers thought that they had to obey them. And so there was a lot of call for the, for the army to protect um, tribes with whom the government had treaties um, from settlers, especially prospectors. So first, uh, Haller comes out uh, with his wife, a newborn baby and a toddler, uh, into Fort Vancouver down on the Columbia. And uh, very quickly, he's getting stationed out at Fort Dalles on the Oregon Trail. Um, this is really where um, you got off the wagon and got onto boats to come down the Columbia and finish your tour down to, down to um, a, a Portland, Oregon city. Um, and I love, I love Henrietta Haller because she just has this very kind of matter of fact uh, way about her, but she writes back to the family who's been very worried about her being stationed in Indian country. And, and re remember, she's from Ireland and she, her family was British aristocracy. 
Uh, so she's kind of a blue blood. And here she is out there at Fort Dalles. And she writes, I spend most of my time with the children, the cow and calf, the pigs and chickens. But we're not concerned with the Indians about our children. I keep them close to the house because of the snakes. <laughs> She's my kind of gal. So Haller is, um, Haller is engaged in um, um, uh, several affairs as, a, as a, an officer uh, on the east side. Uh, most of the time when there were difficulties with Native peoples on the east side of the mountains, if there were wagon trains that had been attacked, uh, and there were several uh, by Native peoples, generally it was not a tribal, it's not uh, something the tribe intended to do as a military operation. It was often uh, young, individual, you know how teenage boys are, right? So young men, hot-headed men who would act impulsively, and then, of course, it's gonna bring the wrath of the army down upon you. Um, Haller was sent out on, on a couple of expeditions after um, some settlers were killed on the trail. Uh, the idea was not to um, was not to punish, but to request the tribes to deliver the perpetrators so that they could be taken to trial. Um, how we would evaluate, in a modern sense, the way those trials were conducted is uh, uh, is open to debate, and I'm not an expert on that. But um, Haller did have um, have some history with. Um, trying and punishing Native peoples out in Idaho. Um, right, where did it go? I forgot that. I just wanted to point out the little red dots here are all the places in the Washington Territory that Haller saw action with the Army. So as you can see, he's somebody who's, who's got action going uh, just about everywhere, throughout the Columbia um, and uh, way up into um, our area right here. And of course, San Juan Island, because he was involved in the Pig War. Okay, so um, there is a bad, there's a, a lot of um, bad blood after the treaties are signed in 1855, and there's a United States special Indian agency, or a special Indian agent uh, named A.J. Bolin, who is sent out to try to um, uh, deal with some, uh, some. Uh, people who need to be chastised for the relationship with the white uh, prospectors. He ends up being murdered by the Yakima. And uh, so Haller and his uh, company of 100 soldiers are sent into Yakima country from Fort Dalles up towards Toppenish to try to convince the Yakima to um, deliver the, the murderers of Agent Bolin. And unfortunately, what he walks into is uh, a wall of Yakima warriors who are waiting for him. And uh, that uh, the, they are immediately virtually surrounded. And ultimately, Haller and his 100 men are going to find that they have up to 1,500 Yakima warriors surrounding them. How Haller got his men back to Fort Dalles is, uh, is uh, um, actually pretty remarkable. Uh, he lost five men, but it was a three-day running retreat all the way back. Um, and the, the end result of this skirmish was that um, the Yakima and affiliated tribes understood that this uh, United States Army is not that tough. We can take these guys. They don't have enough men. We've got a lot more men than they do. And so it begins, it, it begins the beginning, uh, uh, it's the beginning of the uh, Treaty Yakima Wars, which went on for about three, three years in Eastern Washington. And it's often, and it's usually referred to as Haller's defeat, which was, which was really a burr under his saddle. <laughs> He thought he was pretty good for getting his men out of there, but he gets blamed for getting kicked, <laughs> kicked in the rear. So Haller's a really interesting character. He writes a lot. It seems to me from his writings that he had a lot of intentions of publishing memoirs. Um, and his writings on Kamayakin, who was the chief of the Yakima, uh, who had delivered him his, uh, his defeat, he had a lot of respect for him. And so I wanted to read this, um, this uh, 
section of, of his memoirs of, of Kamayakin because it shows you uh, a, a complex man of his times who understands the, um, that these are uh, people with their own right to defend themselves, but he also is a man of manifest destiny who thinks that the nation building, the great spread of American democracy is more important. So he writes, Kamayakin should take rank with the most eminent chiefs of the Indian, worthy of the pen of Fenimore Cooper. He was keen, far-sighted and resolute, and was most bitterly opposed to the encroachments of the white man. His people were told they must give up the lands where they had lived their infancy and manhood, and it was more than they could bear. He, like Leshai of the Nisqually, were great patriots in their own right, defenders of their people and their very way of life. But the march of civilization was against them, and it was our duty to recover the country from savage rule and to preserve it for settlement to the honest, industrious, and law-abiding pioneer. I wish I could state that all our settlers fit that description. The fact that they did not is the primary reason the Army's presence was needed. So you could spend a couple of days parsing out uh, all the things that he is commenting on here, but um, I think that it's because he is thinking critically about what they are doing in the Northwest that, that he makes such a great commentator for us to use his house to study Northwest history on a larger scale. So we were really lucky. Um, last year we had a, a, a guest speaker um, named Emily Washings, who's a member of the um, Yakima tribe. Um, she is an independent scholar. She is married to uh, another native man who is also, he's descended from um, uh, warriors that fought in the Yakima War, but he's also descended from soldiers that fought in the Yakima War. And so they have this, uh, they've been really interested, she's been really interested in her studies to try to um, reach out and contact and study the descendants of soldiers who fought on both sides. And she came to talk for us, um, and she was the one who brought to my attention that um, she had a favorable, a more favorable view of Granville Haller than of the other officers because he was the only one who noted <laughs> that the reason the Yakima decided to go to war, the, the trigger that made them go over, was the fact that uh, the prospectors that had been encroaching on their land had been abusing native women. And it's what set the warriors um, to an aggressive path. So if you were interested, she did this, her presentation by Zoom. If you go to historicwidby.org, uh, there's a search um, field at the bottom of the homepage. And if you write in Washings, uh, you'll be able to get a link to that presentation. It's really fascinating. Um, he also had a lot of respect for Chief Leshai, as most of the Army did. Ch chief Leshai was a um, Nisqually chief. You may have heard of him. He was uh, uh, fighting against the whites during the treaty wars in the 1850s. He was um, brought up on charges by the civilian uh, courts in the Washington Territory, and he was treated as a murderer instead of an enemy combatant. The U.S. Army was very much against trying him in this way for fighting as a soldier and not as a murderer. Uh, but in the end, it was the civilian uh, legislature that um, tried him, uh, sentenced him to hang, which uh, was the last, um, uh, it brought about an end to the hostilities on the western side of the Cascades. But, um, and I think it was in 2004 that our state legislature had a, um, a historical court where they revisited Leshai's case and he was exonerated posthumously from the murder charge. But Haller wrote about him too and, and said that Leshai, like many uh, citizens during this, uh, the struggle for secession, appealed to his instincts his attachment to his tribe, his desire at the same time to conform to the requirements of the whites, which to many of his people were repulsive and incompatible. 
and when they asked for terms of peace, he was entitled to the protection from the officers and soldiers, but on the testimony of a perjured man, he was a martyr to the vengeance of the unforgiving white man. And by the way, there is actually uh, down in Lakewood, uh, near where Leshai was hung, there is a, 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 mon a stone monument and Haller's final um, uh, phrase there was, uh, is inscribed on that. So this is uh, Penn Cove at the time of uh, settlement. The three main villages there were the seat of um, Lower Skagit Power. Isaac Eby was the first settler. You can see he was not messing with them on the cove. He found the good farmland on the west side and he stayed there for the most part. Uh, other settlers started down at the western end of the cove in what was called Coveland and it was the county seat for Island County. So all the territorial courts, um, the courts were held there. Um, and then at the time of the, um, when, the when the treaty wars began, the Penn Cove Special Indian Agency, which is what that rectangle is. This is um, one of the multiple special Indian agencies that were created after the treaties were signed while they were still waiting for uh, ratification, which took four to five years. Um, these were really, uh, if you ask Native peoples about these special Indian agencies, these are really internment camps. So much of the fear uh, when there was war going on on the east side of the mountains was that those tribes were going to enlist the Western tribes to um, collaborate with them to drive white people out of the sound country. And so there was a concerted effort after the treaties were signed to bring, to bring the people in the foothills of the Cascades, the river people, to come down and be held temporarily in these special Indian agencies until the permanent reservations could be established. Life for them was very hard there. Um, as you know, government was not uh, big on honoring treaties that hadn't been ratified yet. Starvation was a problem, disease was a problem. Um, and so at the height of um, the Penn Cove Indian Agency's uh, tenure, there were approximately 80 white settlers living in this region and nearly 3,000 native peoples living on the beach from all different tribes in um, Western Washington. So every time I'm out at the wharf and I look out there, you, I can't not populate the beaches with the longhouses and, um, and all the drama that was going on that you can't tell now that it, the buildings are gone. So Haller is, uh, um, is going to be sent um, on another mission after he returns from uh, Toppenish and, and being defeated there because the army has two directions it has to look. It has to look not just in the, in the eastern Washington where, where the um, tribes are um, uh, in combat, but this people who live, are living on the Sound, not just Native peoples, but the white settlers too, are being, um, are being, uh, they're under attack from these northern tribes that I told you about that are coming down on their slave raids. Um, and so the U.S. government decides it needs two new forts to defend against these uh, war canoes that, are, that come down. Um, and so they, you may know that uh, they established Fort Bellingham here in 1856, um, and uh, they also established Fort Townsend over just south of Port Townsend, and Granville Haller was um, sent to site, build, and command that. And from those two forts, their job was not to, they were not worried about the local Coast Salish people, um, and violence with the local settlers. They were worried about the incursions from these native, uh, the northern na native ra raiders. So these two, um, Fort, um, Fort Townsend is actually now a state park. Uh, there's no buildings left uh, except maybe some foundations uh, from the fort, but this was Granville's, um, Granville Haller's um, position and from there, uh, he often was uh, either on the 
revenue cutters. Uh, Jefferson Davis was one of the ships. The Navy wasn't here very often. They kind of came in, looked around, and went out. And so the defenses, the military defenses here were uh, civilian captains on naval vessels with soldiers. Uh, and so even though Haller was an army man, his men were patrolling all over Puget Sound uh, for northern raiders in the, um, in the USS of Massachusetts primarily. So this is our neighborhood. And uh, I, I will talk a little bit more about this at the very end as we look forward to programs that we want to put on in the future and, and how that affects all of our little towns that uh, exist in this, in this neighborhood. But um, we're still dealing with those five separate cultures that are clashing here um, all the way through the 19th or the 1850s. So um, Haller, Haller is um, going to find his way all over the Northern Sound. He is the voice for the people of Whidbey Island who are terrified of these Northern Raiders. You may know that in 1857, Isaac Eby was attacked in his home uh, on Whidbey Island by um, Northern Raiders who, um, who uh, shot him and uh, took his head as a, as a prize. Um, and it sent shock waves, just incredible terror throughout the entire Washington Territory. And people are leaving in droves. This is a really high level, almost like uh, where were you when Kennedy was shot kind of thing. Um, because Isaac Eby was a very high profile po political figure considered to be a candidate for Congress or a territorial delegate to Congress or as the territorial governor. Very well liked by the settlers and here he is killed in his home and his head taken. Uh, so people start leaving in droves and Haller is writing to his superiors at Fort Stillicum saying, a large number of highly respectable citizens who have settled upon Whidbey's Island have accumulated considerable property, stock, etc., cetera, uh, which with the valu valuable improvements on their claims would be much exposed to the depredations of the Russian and British Indians in the event of a descent and might tempt them to plunder the island. This does not take into consideration the danger to life, as many would probably leave their homes. The locations of the troops at Bellingham Bay and Port Townsend will not produce the moral effect upon these Indians, which they do upon the Indians residing in their immediate neighborhood. These Indians can approach without being seen at either station and hastily de destroying what they do not carry off can disappear without a trace by which to pursue them. The settlers believe themselves to be very much exposed. Should it be convenient for a U.S. naval vessel to cruise among the islands north of this place and occasionally anchor in Penn's Cove, it would give a feeling of security to the inhabitants of that island. These claims, these calls for help uh, from higher up uh, usually went unanswered. So he did come up here into your territory here in 1859. Uh, you may know that there was a, a raid of Nooksack Indians on the, on the Whatcom, uh, the small community of Whatcom, uh, and they called for naval assistance, and it was Haller uh, on the Massachusetts that came. And um, the map that you see there, if you look at the white uh, line that goes from Bellingham Bay up over the border, that's the Whatcom Trail. That was the trail that prospectors had uh, started to build during the Fraser River Gold Rush. Um, uh, the Nooksack had come down and attacked and then had their, um, it had not gone well for them and they were forced to retreat. I think uh, Henry roder has got some pretty good memoirs on that. Sandy, maybe you know that about Roeder and his description of, of the, the raid. But at any rate, Haller and his men, they came into Bellingham Bay and uh, they went up the Whatcom Trail and intercepted the uh, 25 nook sack um, at the river uh, and took hostages um, until uh, uh, certain uh, negotiations could be carried out. So Haller was even here in Whatcom defending um, your, your former your, the, your, the former occupants of your community um, in times of trouble. 
Because it was 1859, I'm not really sure about the way it works out, but it may be that Pickett had, was already on San Juan Island when this happened, which is why they would be calling for Haller instead of your local guy. Um, and Haller's also going to be involved in the Pig War, and this is kind of a fun one for me because, you know, um, uh, you've got George Pickett, who's going to be, be famous in the Civil War fighting for the Confederacy, and you've got, got Granville Haller, who is going to fight for the Union, but probably doesn't, doesn't have a whole lot more luck, <laughs> no more personal luck than, than uh, Pickett did uh, in his escapades out there. But um, uh, Haller outranked Pickett, but Pickett was the one who was sent here to command, and Haller was a little bit put out that uh, when he wants to come and help Pickett out on San Juan Island, um, Pickett would not let him land and did not want him to come. Uh, there was a tension and animosity between Pickett and Haller that um, was gonna last, obviously. It's like a kind of a precursor to the Civil War because sectional, sectional sides were already being taken in 1859 by the army. So, if you've been to, do you guys, you all guys all know about Pickett and the Pig War? I, I, can, I, I figured you would, but um, in Coopville, I can't take that for granted. So these, uh, so um, when, these are panels that, uh, from San Juan Island Nas National Historical Park, um, which commemorates the Pig War. I, used, I worked there, I was very fortunate to work there for a few seasons. and. Uh, uh, one of the panels shows the British warships aiming their guns at Pickett's camp on the left-hand side of the redoubt, but the ship over on the right is the USS Massachusetts, and that's where uh, Granville Haller is grumbling to himself that, that that awful southerner won't let him land and be important on San Juan Island. So he is going to go back and fight for the Union. He's going to have... Uh, he, so. As a narrator for his times, his experience in the Civil War is, is really fascinating. He's fighting for the Union, but there's a lot of um, officers that are going back to fight for the Union who are what you might call copperheads. These were war Democrats. They're people who believe that the war should, was justified to save the Union, but um, they were not in any way interested in ending slavery. The war was not about slavery to them. Um, so uh, a lot of them were anti-Republicans, uh, were not supporters of Abraham Lincoln, and Haller was one of those. He served as the commander of uh, the headquarters guard for General George McClellan. Uh, if you're familiar with George McClellan, you may know that um, he and Lincoln were not very good friends. Uh, Lincoln had uh, basically dismissed him as head of the army uh, twice, and after the second time, uh, McClellan chose to run against Lincoln for president in 1864. Um, Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, was so convinced that McClellan was orchestrating a coup to take over the government that he, um, he engaged in a purge of all of McClellan's men uh, anyone who might be sympathetic to McClellan got purged from the army, and um, Haller was one of those. So he was dismissed without a trial, uh, without a court-martial, after 23 years of service in the army, right after Gettysburg. It was especially galling to him because he had an amazing role to play uh, be just before he was cashiered, and that is, is just before Gettysburg, when... Um, when Lee's army was coming over, up north over the Pennsylvania border, he wasn't headed for Gettysburg. He was headed for Harrisburg, which was uh, the, it's the capital of Pennsylvania, and it's on the other side of the very wide Susquehanna River. So they came up on the west side of the river, and they, the only way for them, for Jubal Early to take his army, the Confederate army, across to Harrisburg was to take, to go over the famous Columbia Wrightsville Bridge. Well, Haller was um, from that area. He was from York, which is just a few miles away from there. He happened to be home on sick leave. He was called up to, uh, to um, recruit volunteers to try to slow down the Confederate Army while Lee was trying to catch up. So he can't, with his handful of 
Pennsylvania volunteers stop the Confederate Army, which is thousands of men, um, but he can keep them from crossing the Columbia Bridge. And so what you see in this painting here is a representation of the Columbia Bridge over the Susquehanna being burned um, on the order of Granville Haller. It was successful. It kept the uh, Confederate Army from crossing the uh, Susquehanna and reaching Harrisburg, and they were forced to turn back and uh, uh, gather at a little burg called Gettysburg. So Haller must have thought at the end of this that he was going to get um, lots of praise for having turned the army around, but instead he was called in and cashiered for uttering allegedly disloyal statements. Um, and so at that point, he came back to Washington as a civilian while the war was still going on and started farming, investing in uh, sawmills and uh, anything else he could uh, find to keep himself out of trouble. Uh, he became the first Grand Master of Woodby's Masonic Temple. Uh, he was a post Coopville's postmaster, the county treasurer, um, and uh, he's, a, he's kind of an old man potter. Uh, by the time he's done, he makes an awful lot of money out here in land speculation and investing in mills and infrastructure. Uh, he ends up, uh, he leaves Coopville in 1879 and he uh, ultimately uh, builds an 18-room mansion on First Hill in Seattle. Um, the entire time that he lived in Coopville, which was 16 years, he was lobbying Congress for a court-martial to clear his name for the, from the charge of uh, disloyalty. And ultimately, in 1879, he uh, was granted his court-martial and was exonerated. Uh, and so he actually spent three years before retiring, recommissioned in the uh, army as a colonel. So the women of the Haller House, who uh, uh, it's, we just don't have a whole lot of information on them, but they're teasers. Henrietta uh, was uh, actually the brains, the financial brains of the operation. Uh, she was the money, her family left her some money, which is how they began the speculating on all the investments um, here. Uh, Haller asked his wife, or his wife, his niece, uh, Nellie Moore, back in, uh, um, back east, if she would, he said he would send her to a private academy to be educated if she would come out and teach his children. Uh, and so she did, she came out, she ran a school out of the Haller House. Um, it's a school that attracted people from as far away as Bellingham. Uh, she became very well known and uh, Henry Roeder sent his son John here. She became very good friends with the Roeders. Um, and ultimately, after she married the town's namesake son, Thomas Coop, uh, they moved up north uh, to uh, Whatcom. She ultimately um, became superintendent of schools, and when the counties split up Skagit and Whatcom, she was the first superintendent of uh, Whatcom County Schools. Um, the other uh, woman of interest uh, to us up here is uh, Emma Coots. This was a, a woman who was hired help in uh, the Haller household. She was, uh, her father was an American settler named Charles Coots, and her mother was a native woman. Um, he was, uh, but he wasn't the first sheriff, was he? He was second, second sheriff. sheriff of Whatcom County. So, um, so even though it's kind of embarrassing that this is the first time I've been in this building, <laughs> living so close, the network of these people, despite the distances, despite not having automobiles or telephones or any of the things that we rely on to keep our, our social networks going, these people still found a way to develop relationships with people in other communities. So uh, I know that, uh, um, uh, we have a potential um, physical remnant of Haller's friendship with Rotor here, and I'm hoping that someday we can prove whether it's true or not. Um, and I'll get to it in a second. I forgot this slide. <laughs> so I do want to point out that this is 2023 that we're about to start on, 
And in three years, history organizations are looking at the celebration of the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Um, for those of us who, I think everybody in this room, uh, probably almost everybody in this room remembers this, uh, the bicentennial back in 1976, uh, it's probably not gonna be celebrated the same way now, but I wanna take advantage, we wanna take advantage of um, uh, this opportunity to be to offer programs and celebrations that include a much more diverse background and to take some time to look back and say that the things about our history that are hard for us to reconcile with how we see ourselves as a people, we've come a long way and I think that this anniversary gives us a chance to celebrate the progress we've made even if we still have a lot longer to go to fulfill some of our country's promises. And I hope that Bellingham is going to want to do this too. So our house, that means what we have is three years left to get our house open. Um, and I'll tell you what our house is going to be. So this is a, an aerial shot of the enormous two block <laughs> length of uh, Coopville's historic, historic district. The wharf uh, uh, is there on the left, as you can see in the museum at the uh, foot of the wharf. And then the Haller House is on the right-hand side there. So the entire two-block historical um, uh, grid is, is really encapsulated between the museum and the wharf on one side and the Haller House and the public gardens on the other, on the other side. Um, this is, these are pictures of the house when we first got it. The house has now been gutted. All the plaster is down. Um, everything is down to bare bones and studs. But um, there are remnants uh, in the house of original uh, finishes, which we are preserving. And where we can't preserve, we're replicating. Um, some of the hardware, this is, I don't know if you can see it, but this particular um, rim lock is a is a molded um, iron um, figure. It's got a, like a Grecian goddess or a Roman goddess in a garden. Um, just uh, not something that the average pioneer had in his houses. It really kind of speaks to Henrietta and her tastes, her aristocratic tastes. I'll point out on this one, that's a faux grain painting. If any of you are into. Uh, as the kind of interior finishes that uh, um, people used in the 19th century to try to make things look more expensive or exotic than they actually were. Uh, all the interior doors in the Haller House were faux grain painted, so uh, they would have had to have had, had some uh, aspirations to style to do that. Um, just a sampling in the one parlor. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time uh, dig, d in wallpaper archaeology. Uh, six different layers of wallpaper in this parlor. Uh, and we have uh, preserved a section where you can see the strata of wallpaper. So when you come in, you can see, you can look and celebrate how we don't use that kind of wallpaper anymore. Um, we have a rather large gallery that was damaged by fire that has very little. The mantle is gone around the fireplace. The wallpaper was all gone. A lot of the, um, any kind of decor um, was gone. But uh, we have just enough wallpaper that we're able to uh, reproduce um, uh, what, what was there originally. So that'll all come back. This is a, actually a really good space for exhibits. So these two rooms that I've just shown you are going to be uh, exhibits that are focusing, educating on the territorial period of Washington. So basically the tenure that the Howlers were there. So from say, eight, uh, 1850 to 1879, because most places don't spend a lot of time on that era. Uh, the back wing of the house is going to become a new mercantile store with a Victorian soda fountain. Uh, and the idea, these are pictures uh, that uh, have inspired what we want to do with the mercantile store. Uh, that's our plan for uh, generating enough revenue to support the house uh, so that we don't have to worry about it falling into disrepair again. Uh, the, the photograph on the left is actually the soda fountain back bar that we have acquired for the Haller House. 
uh, and we're still on the hunt for one of those great marble um, fountain dispensers. Uh, the canoe is not ours. <laughs> So um, we had a historic landscape study done so that we could recreate a Victorian garden that would be similar to what Henrietta had. She actually um, wrote quite a lot about what she was growing in her garden, so we have some indication of what she would have had. Um, and this, is, this was the teaser. This is the Bellingham teaser. When we lifted the house to put a foundation under it, it was sitting on sandstone piers hand-hewn sandstone piers. Um, that section of the house was built in 1866, so we were looking for a source for uh, sandstone that would be that old. Um, and in fact, uh, the Chuckanut Sandstone Quarry was uh, launched in the 1850s, and we know that Haller knew uh, Roeder, who opened it. So it, uh, we can't prove that these, uh, there's about um, a dozen of these piers. We can't prove that they came from Chuckanut uh, quarries, but uh, we plan to use them as uh, landscape features in our garden so that everybody will be able to go and touch them and play with them. They're very tactile. You really can't keep your hands off them. <laughs> So things we've done, we, uh, we acquired the house in 2018. We put on a new cedar shingle roof. Uh, we, to lift the house, we had to take the fireplace all the way down to the ground and rebuild it. Uh, we had to lift the house. You can see there's no chimney there because we had to take it down. The windows were out being rehabbed. So far, that's been the most expensive element of the rehab is the restoring of the original 19th century windows. Um, we put it on a concrete foundation, but we didn't want it to look like concrete. It had originally had wood skirting around the crawl space, so we had the concrete molded with, uh, to look like the original wood skirting. So that is all concrete. Uh, new porches. There's a view out our bay windows that are all rehabbed. They're beautiful. Uh, we rebuilt the conservatory. There was a lot of cursing involved with that. There's no audio to this, thank goodness. Uh, and I took this picture this morning. Um, the painters have put primer on the house. It's no longer dark chocolate brown. Uh, there's much rejoicing in town to see the chocolate brown disappear. So we won't get the house completely painted till spring, but it's gonna have a, a darker trim. Um, but it is kind of a wheat gold and it will stay that color because that's the color Henrietta colored it and I don't want her to get mad at me. <laughs> that was a couple of days ago. And the back is completely rebuilt and you can see that do the door there, that's the actual um, color that all the trim will be. Uh, this was pre-primed new siding so it's blue. And then we put our chimney back. We rebuilt our back-to-back -back fireplaces. They're both going to be functioning, so it's going to be the home of Dickensian and Christmas celebrations. And uh, we re rebuilt our iconic chimney, which we're very happy about because it's our logo. Had to come back. We actually labeled the face bricks there in the pattern, numbered them so that when the mason put them back together again, they could go back in the same place. Uh, still needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but it's there. So, thank you all for hanging in there for that whole thing. If, if you're uh, interested, I have brochures in the back, and if you wanted to be on our um, e-newsletter, you can leave your email on the clipboard there. Do you have any questions? Yes. Oh, I want to see. 
see that. Really? Will you tell us what it yes, was? I would love to. Okay. So, what's this mess in Bellingham and the, the one guy gets killed? Then the uh, county commission, they know that all hell is going to break loose when the army comes over. So, Deputy Sheriff John Tennant, who is a future superintendent of schools and is on the county commission, he's just all kinds of things. And he has a lovely wife, uh, whose father is a very important man, and she, her brother-in-law is Nooksack. Okay? So Deputy Sheriff Tennant heads up the river to talk to Chief Hotello, who's the principal chief of the Nooksack at the crossing. Um, village. And so he goes up there and he tells them what's going to happen if the army gets in there. And so he arranges for five guys to be brought down river and turned over. I, ending this dispute and it wasn't him at all. Tennant had already gotten it stopped. I, I, I will just say that I didn't get the story from Haller's record. I got it from Clarence Bagley's history. From what? Clarence Bagley, oh. the historian. So it's an older record. Yeah. But it's hard to find information on it anywhere. Yeah, so I've got the official. So you've got the official. Here. See, and this is why I travel here. with Candy is because she keeps me straight and narrow. <laughs> she gives me stuff, I give her stuff. It's really yeah, cool. we're always throwing. But it's really interesting because I haven't read that military report. I've only read what the Washington County report. I haven't we're read the military the report either. Well, we're going to have to solve that one. Um, I, I always, I've always wanted to know more about that particular raid because, uh, well, for lots of reasons, but one that's really interesting to me about Haller personally is, is I don't think there are any other officers in the Army who was actively engaged in hostilities with Indians on the east side of the Cascades and on the west. So he's dealing with the Plateau tribes and with the Norder, Northern Raiders at the same time in his career. So once again, he's a window into all kinds of narrative threads of history of our area and so I see so much potential for his house to make those stories available to the public. But it's what we see. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of things I haven't seen and then I write from what I have seen and you can get different versions of it. I, I'm going to hack your computer. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Nothing's on it. Oh. It's old school, paper. right? Everything's handwritten on paper. Yeah, it's all in paper. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about Loder. Loder had a farm in Kootenai Nation. Yeah, and Candy knows all about that. <laughs> Can't Roder's farm. Did he have a farm on Whidbey? Roder? Yeah. I don't know much about that, but yeah, he was over on Whidbey and he had a farm and stuff, yeah. Yeah. In Olympia. The territorial right, in Olympia. The only quarry of sandstone. Right. Those, those, uh, those stones are underneath our brick building. I believe it. I, I, knew it I knew it had a history of be, like building the territory. Yeah. Um, and it belonged to Rotor. Mm hmm. So. Yeah. I think it's Rotor pretty. I, I w if there were a, a, a sandstone historian who could look at those. I mean, we have so many people. They're laying in the front yard because they're too heavy to move. <laughs> and so people are always stopping to talk about them. And we don't worry about them being stolen because they're so heavy. But everybody wants to, you just try to imagine each little divot being, being cut by hand. It's pretty crazy. Les, isn't there somebody up here that has worked on that and wrote an article for the journal on the Chuck and Seems to me there's an article that I saw. Well, we yeah. well, look my okay. Anything else? Anybody got a historic building they need to save and want advice? <laughs> our, most of our houses are gone except for the ticket box. Yeah. 
Just the churches. Church, I know. Yeah. 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 They, we they have a lot of yeah. Well, this is what happens when your town actually grows and becomes something. You know, we look at Port Townsend started at the same time, but it's a completely different uh, generation of architecture over there. Yeah. Well, thank you all for, for your attention. It's great to be here. Well, I want to thank Lynn and uh, all of you for coming tonight, and I hope you enjoyed this. It's a pretty good program. So uh, next month, uh, we're going to have uh, Dawn here talking about the Christmas ship. So I hope to see you all then. Thanks for coming. <laughs>